been doing these character studies I've tried to focus on women give women some equal play time not that Pastor Joe um, does an incredible job of of equaling the playing field Um, but there are a lot of people out there who do dismiss women and women of the Bible but it's been a a privilege for me because every time I prepare for one of these things I learn a whole lot And no, Rob, she was not married to Jesus. I know you were just joking. But there was a lot of, uh, I'm always amazed at all the stuff out there um, when you you start preparing for something like this. And and so we're just going to start with a little bit of background information. And then we'll, um, depending on how much time we have, we'll talk about what Mary Magdalene can, what we can learn from her. What is it that we can take away from this? And we first read about Mary Magdalene in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through the, one through 3. So if you want to turn to that, you can. Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Now, Mary Magdalene was one of the main women who traveled with Jesus as he went throughout the country. And she was actually from the town of Magdala, which is found on the coast of the Sea of Galilee. And it's a town whose main industry was fishing. And in addition to that, they created a lot of fine linens like wools and dyes that were used in manufacturing for uh, garments. We don't know the source, but we know that Mary must have been financially independent, and it's believed that she lived in a comfortable village house. So not, not a lot of in-depth material to find out about Mary, but um, just a, a, little, a little background. Now, Magdala was home to a lot of Greeks, and with the Greeks came their Hellenistic culture. So we need to kind of put this in perspective. This was after Alexander the Great's conquest, which had extended from India all the way through Egypt. And this affected the language, the philosophy, all the culture of the Jews and the early Christians. Um, And it's hard to believe, but at that time, the Greek language was as common as the English language is today. Uh, The language was so common that the Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek. Uh, Have you? Yes. Septuagint. Septuagint. Yeah, I would have slaughtered it. That's what it's called. Um, And there were a lot of other Greek traditions um, that became common at that time. Some of the Jews began writing epic poems and plays in the Greek language. And Magdala was considered a... um, kind of a cosmopolitan town, whereas Jesus of Nazareth was from a little village, a conservative village. And there are actually remains of Magdala still there today. It's not inhabited, but you can go there and see the remains. So it's in this setting when Jesus has his first encounter with her. It's where he redeems her. Now, we don't have the specifics, but we know that Mary Magdalene was delivered of Um, seven demons which had caused her to be very ill. We aren't sure how they met but Magdala was close to both Nazareth and Cana and it's likely that Jesus visited here many times. At some point during one of those visits Jesus healed her. 
After being healed, Mary kind of became the leader of this group of women who traveled with Jesus. Um, they helped to support him financially, and it's referenced in the verse where it reads, these women were helping to support them out of their means, out of their own means. Other women in the group included Joanna and Susanna, and Joanna was the wife of Herod's uh, steward. Um, and that's kind of important because she was a woman of high social standing and she probably had a lot of connections in the community. Um, the author of Luke wanted um, his gospel to appeal to um, Greeks and their Hellenistic culture and the Gentile population. So he wanted um, Jesus to be associated with kind of uh, well-placed citizens, well-connected, law-abiding people. So there weren't any tabloid magazines or Facebook or Instagram or any of those things, but I guess she would, would kind of have um, a celebrity status a little bit because she was, her husband was Herod's, you know, head of his house, head of his home. So Joanna, um, her presence was special. We also know, so they met in Magdala, and then we know that Mary was present at the crucifixion. Um, all four of the Gospels say that women were at the scene, and Mary Magdalene was prominent among those women. We read in Luke 23, 49. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Jesus delivered Mary from the demons that oppressed her, and she was at his side when he breathed his last breath. Mary was also when Jesus, when they placed him in the tomb. If you um, turn over to Luke 23, verses 55 through 56, it says, The women who had come with him from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day, they rested in accordance with the commandment. Jesus' death was later disputed by some, but because Mary and the other women, in addition to the testimony of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a respected member of the council, his death was verified. Um, in fact, Deuteronomy 19.15 states that there have to be two or three witnesses to prove a case. We read next that Mary went to the tomb with the other women to pre prepare Jesus' body. Now there's, account, there's an account of this in, in each of the Gospels, but I just chose to stay with Luke because that's, that's where I started. And it's in Luke 23, 1 through 10. So let's go there and read that together. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, the women went to the tomb taking spices which they had made ready. And they found the stone rolled back from the tomb. But when they went inside, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed and wondering what to do about this, behold, two men in dazzling raiment suddenly stood beside them. And as the women were frightened and were bowing their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among those who are dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be given over to the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And having returned from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven apostles and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna the Mar and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who reported these things to the apostles. So imagine for a moment what it must have been like to be a woman in that time. Few rights, little respect, let, yet Jesus chose her to be his messenger. Jesus chose Mary to be his witness. And we can learn a lot for her, from her. For one thing, Mary was grateful. God delivered her of seven demons. She went on not only to follow Jesus, but to serve and support him. 
When someone does something for us, it's natural for us to want to do something for them. And being grateful is defined as appreciation for benefits received, expressing gratitude. Now there's a, um, a syndicated columnist, Carl Rowan, tells about a teacher who greatly influenced his life. His autobiography, Breaking Barriers, he tells the story of a quote that his teacher, Miss Thompson, had shared with his class. The quote originated with Chicago architect Daniel Burnham, so his teacher had shared this with their class. I listened intently as she read, make no little plans, they have no magic to stir men's blood and probably themselves will not be realized. Make big plans, aim high and hope and work. Remember that our sons and grandsons are going to do things that would stagger us. More than 30 years later, her former student gave a speech in which he stated that his teacher, Francis Thompson, had given him a desperately needed belief in himself. A newspaper printed the story, and someone mailed the clipping to his beloved teacher. She later wrote to Rowan, You have no idea what that newspaper story meant to me. For years, I endured my brother's arguments that I'd wasted my life, that I should have married and had a family. When I read that you gave me credit for helping to launch a marvelous career, I put the clipping in front of my brother. After he read it, I said, you see, I didn't really waste my life, did I? So Rowan had no idea that Miss Thompson's brother had made her to feel like she'd wasted her life. He was simply expressing his gratitude to the woman who'd helped him to believe in himself. What's been done for you? Who has encouraged you? Who's made a difference in your life? Who do we need to shower with gratitude? What are we waiting for? The next thing that Mary was was generous. Generosity is is defined as the quality of being kind and generous. We're not told how, but we assume that Mary was independently wealthy. We don't know if she was a successful businesswoman or maybe she inherited money. Um, But we know that Mary faithfully followed Jesus after her deliverance. And just like today, travel comes with expenses. Can you verify that, Robin Nadine? Yeah. Okay. There's food to be purchased and there's accommodations to be paid for. If you have pets, you've got to pay for a pet sitter. You've got to have modes of transportation. All of those things that we have to do today, they had to do in that time as well. Those who traveled with Jesus did not get a free ride. Even if Mary didn't do anything but pay her own way, that was a substantial cost. But she was generous with her, mind, her time. She was generous with her money. Maybe you don't have a lot of money. Maybe all we have to give is ourselves. And I think of Roy, or I think of the praise and worship team, or I think of Debbie who does the bulletins, or I think of the countless hours that Pastor Joe puts into doing things for our church. I often think of Craig because he is here so many hours. There's so many generous people in this church. It's unbelievable. I think of Miss Phyllis, who comes and cleans the church. I think of the people who stay late to turn the lights off and lock the doors. So it doesn't have to be money. Maybe it's your time. Maybe you know somebody who just needs you to invest some time in them. I wanted to share one quick um, story because I could relate to this so much. Rebecca Garvison could feel the passenger's eyes rolling as she walked toward her seat carrying her newborn Riley. Anybody ever travel with a baby? It is not a fun experience. One time I did it with Samuel. He was like a month or two old and I had our ridiculous cat Moses. So here I am with this cat carrier and Samuel in my arm and of course I paid the extra $25 to put the cat under the seat and Samuel was sick. It was horrible. 
Nobody ever said, can I help you? And there was no such things as those signs like we have now that say, pregnant or expectant mothers or mothers of young babies can park here. There was none of that. The airline stewardess didn't say, all children with, uh, all people with young children can board first. It was every man for himself. So poor, poor Rebecca, she had baby Riley and they were flying from Kalamazoo, Michigan to Fort Rucker, Alabama, when, where her husband was stationed. Minutes into the flight, Riley wailed. A nearby couple glared, so Rebecca moved. Riley was still crying when their seatmate, when her seatmate, Nyfisha Miller, asked if she could try holding, holding her. Riley quickly fell asleep in Miller's arms and stayed that way throughout the flight. Nyfisha Miller, you will never understand how happy this act of kindness has made my family, she wrote on Facebook. You could have just been irritated like everyone else, but you held Riley the entire flight and let me get some rest and peace of mind. It doesn't have to be money. It doesn't have to be material goods. It can just be an act of kindness. Who do you need to be gracious to? Um, who do you need to be generous with? Mary was also gracious, though. That's the point I'm getting to next. I know you guys are getting hungry, so I'll try to get through real fast. Now, gracious is defined as being godly, pleasing, acceptable, and marked by kindness and courtesy. When was the last time you went on a long trip? Or better yet, when was the last time you had an extended house guest? How many of you know that people are just that? We're people. We're imperfect, fallible, and at times, believe it or not, each and every one of us in here are annoying. <laughs> Yet Mary and this group of women supporting Jesus appear to have been gracious to one another. There are no scripture references about hissy fits or tantrums among the women. They had a job to do and they set out to do it with grace. Maybe we all need a better picture of grace. And maybe this list will help us. I thought it was pretty good. These are characteristics of graciousness. Being gracious is someone who is humble and desires to praise others. Someone who is gracious would never seek out to embarrass another person deliberately. A gracious individual is quick to say thank you for even the smallest gesture listening to the other person more than talking about yourself is gracious not one-upping someone or being spiteful is considered being gracious a gracious person makes a point of paying attention to others consciously being mindful to say what is appropriate is a gracious choice seeking out ways to make others feel comfortable and appreciated being gracious means knowing you're not indispensable and you respect everyone's contribution. To be gracious is to recognize the good in everyone and every situation as the first option. Now, I, I know uh, most of you heard me talk about my friend Terry. She passed away, it was a year ago in January. She's probably the most gracious person that I ever knew. I mean, it was, it was almost nauseating <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> she could see the best in everybody. I mean, you could tell her, you could tell her that everything around you had just collapsed, and she, well, we've got to look on the bright side. This is the great thing, you know. Just you know, she could find the silver lining in the darkest, blackest cloud, and that's just the way she was. And it was so unfamiliar to me. I came from a critical home where everything that we did was scrutinized. There was never uplifting, there was always criticizing. When we went home from church we had to talk about everything that had gone wrong or who had done what or what had gone wrong. It was just so opposite of what I was, was used to. And we would go to her house and she would treat us like we were queens and kings. She'd even get those little Andes mints, even though those beds were so uncomfortable. She put a little mint on there 
<laughs> She'd had these beds and mattresses since she was a kid. They were in terrible shape. God love her, but she tried. And every time we went there, every time we went for a big visit, it wasn't necessarily us, but something terrible would happen. And it would make me feel like they're never going to want me to come back. One time we went, the wash machine broke. One time we went, the hot water heater broke. The next time we went, the bathtub leaked and water was coming down through the ceiling. And every time the devil would say, they're never going to want you to come back. Her husband, who um, does, he doesn't do stand-up comedy, but he's just a comedic gentleman. He would say, well, if we want to have something major replaced, we'll just invite the vices to come because we know something will break. But they never, ever said, you're in the way, you're getting on my nerves. It was always, they were just gracious. Who do we need to be gracious to? Who in your life have you made to feel like they are in your way? We've had a lot of experience with this recently. Have an extended house guest. I hope that I was gracious. What's one thing that we can do to be more gracious? Maybe there's a word that you permanently need to delete from your vocabulary that, that's offensive to somebody. Maybe you have an annoying nickname for somebody that you need to delete. Maybe there's a bad habit. Being gracious requires you to think about others. Maybe it's an action you need to start. Mary was also genuine. She's defined, or, and genuine is defined as having the apparent qualities or character actually produced by or proceeding from the source. Sincerely and honestly felt or experienced. Actual, true free from hypocrisy or pretense, sincere. Being genuine is a lot more about how we relate to other people. We're genuine when we reach out to others in a caring and authentic way. It means being warm towards other people. Now Mary was the real deal. She was a bona fide believer in the amazing work and transforming work of Jesus Christ. She went away from a life of misery and oppression to a life of victory. There is an unburdening which occurs when we're truly cleansed. Her heart was exfoliated. Anybody in here ever use an exfoliant? Okay. It doesn't feel great. I mean, it's not painful, but you do feel a difference after you exfoliate. Mary's heart was exfoliated. Mary felt fresh and new throughout or after she experienced deliverance. Her redemption cleansed her from hypocrisy, insincerity, and pretense. Her encounter with Christ drove her to follow him, support him, stay by his side in death, go and tell others of his resurrection. And the impact that Christ had on her life was life-altering. When I think of genuine people, I think about my grandfather. Now, nobody in here knows my grandfather, but I know that something dramatic had to occur in his life, which changed the course of his life until his death. Now, um, not long ago, Roy and I were having dinner with this other couple, and um, the lady said, "So, what are you going to do? What are you, what are you going to do about work?" I didn't know what to say. Well, we're hiring. We're hiring in all positions, and I think you would be great at it. Oh, okay, great. I still didn't know what to say. But I want my life to be so radically changed that people should know. They should never have to ask me, what are you going to do about a job? When they look at me, they need to know that Jesus Christ touched my life. He made me different. He called me to do something specific. That is how I want my life to be. And that is how Mary's life was. That is how my grandfather's life was. On Father's Day, my sister posted this on Facebook. I guess she and Kenny had been cleaning out the attic. 
and she found his passport and all his notes from when he had gone to the Holy Land. My, fa my grandfather was a very modest man. He wrote down every penny that he spent. He took down little notes. It was beautiful to see that. She said, how ironic that Kenny found this jewel today. My granddaddy would have been 93 yesterday, and he was by far the best preacher, friend, uncle, dad, granddad, brother to many, veteran, and most importantly, a man of God that I've ever known. These documents were from his trip to the Holy Land in the summer of 68 when I was two and a half. From other pictures, I know that I was at the Norfolk Airport when he left for this adventure. What an awesome opportunity for a man from Williamston, Doodle Hill, Martin County. He started the Pentecostal Holiness Church in Robertsonville with no formal education, but read everything he could and was wise beyond his years. Like Jesus, he was a carpenter when he wasn't preaching. He worked on countless church expansions, remodels, as well as repairs while serving his churches. He also became an author in an attempt to help other pastors with their churches. She said, Happy Father's Day in heaven, Granddaddy. Love and miss you, but thankful for the Christian legacy you left your family, friend, and church members. Are we genuinely changed? When I think of genuine, I, I thought of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, you know, we don't have any faultless people, but he was a, I believe he was a man of integrity, and I believe that something happened in his life to not only serve the Lord, but he believed a part of that calling was to start or to be active in the civil rights movement. And I think he... He genuinely cared about the advancement of civil rights. Something happened to change him. I guess I'm just a little concerned that we don't act like something dramatic has happened in our lives. No, we cannot go around all the time um, preaching to every... Well, maybe you could if that's what God called you to do. But I think we need to be more appreciative. We need to be ready to give. We need to be kind and courteous. And we need to be sincere. We should never... I don't ever want anybody to ask have to ask you or may, maybe the way to put it would be we should be so different that no one should ever have to ask us what's different about us they should automatically know you're a man of integrity you're always appreciative you're always gracious you're really genuine there should be markers about us that are different. If there's not, then we need to seek God, ask him to show us where we need to grow. And that's what I want us to do tonight. I know y'all are probably getting hungry, but... What are, the, what are the things within you that are preventing you from being recognized as a dramatically changed person. And really, I, I think it starts with um, repentance. I think we allow things to come in. We allow things to creep into our lives. And I say we because I'm including me in that. We allow compromise. We allow lies. Whatever it is for you, but I believe there's things that we allow to come into our lives that put between us and God a wall that prevent, for, prevent other people from being able to see the dramatic change that's taken place. So I just want to pray tonight. I want to pray that whatever it is that is separating you from God that is separating you from other people, that is keeping you from being gracious or genuine, generous, 
whatever. The four G's. I just want you to pray and ask God, hey, would you show me? Sometimes we don't even know. We don't even realize that we've allowed these things to creep in. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I, I thank you for Mary. I thank you for her transformed life, Father. I thank you for her faithfulness to you, Lord. And Lord, what a, what a faithful woman she was, Lord. She was there with you as you traveled. She was there with you through death. She went and told the disciples that you, you were not dead. Lord, you have transformed us. When we called upon you, Lord, when we asked you to come into our hearts, Lord, when we surrendered our lives to you, Father, you did an amazing work in us. But Lord, we have allowed things to come in to separate us from you, Lord. And Lord, each of us is so different. We, no two of us are the same, Father. So Father, I just pray right now as we ask you to search our hearts, Lord, that you would reveal to each one Reveal to us, Lord, those things that we've allowed to come in that rob us of our ability to be gracious and generous, genuine. Lord, whatever it is that separates us from you, Lord, Father, I pray tonight that we would repent of that, Lord. And that as we repent, Father, is we receive your forgiveness. We would reclaim that power. And our testimony will be unshakable. Yes, Lord. Our gratitude, our graciousness will be noticed. Others around us will begin scratching their head and wondering, saying, what's different about them? Lord, we don't ever want to be the same. We want to be transformed. Lord, help us all to be Mary's. Help us all to surrender to you. It's in your name we pray this, Lord. Amen.